G'day ladies and gents, and welcome to the Dornier 335. Yes, that's right. We're uh, having a look at Germany's probably most famous super prop. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a little story time, I think. We're going to start off with a little bit of a, a cap or a recap of, of the history of the Dornier 335 in War Thunder. Now, when the Dornier 335 was introduced, uh, it was nothing short of a disappointment. It was extremely difficult to fly. It got unfavorable matchmaking. It didn't even have an air spawn. Uh, the guns weren't that great. But most importantly, it was extremely hard to get this thing on target because the rudder was worse than the MiG-19. And I mentioned this in the Mark 22 video that I did a couple of days ago. Actually, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. And, uh, yeah, the Dornier 335 has, used to have an absolutely terrible rudder. So, like I said, if you take the MiG-19 and multiply it by about 10, you had the Dornier 335. You also had to play it roughly the same way. Because if you were too fast in the Dornier, you would overspeed, you would compress, and it wouldn't be fun. Uh, but if you played too slow... You were caught by P-47Ms, Griffin Spitfires, uh, and all manner of super props by the Allies. And it just wasn't very fun, overall. It wasn't terribly enjoyable, it was just miserable. But then it got fixed. And so, a few patches ago, I'm not actually sure how long ago it was, but uh, it might have been about six months to a year ago, the Dornier 335 seemed to have improved. The rudder was a lot more effective. I think they essentially doubled the rudder's ability because they probably forgot to count for that second one underneath, giving the Dornier 335 its its nickname, the Arrow. The plane itself actually performs reasonably well for now, at the moment. Uh, one thing I will notice is that uh, the 335's Guns are a little bit hard to get on target still, but that's due to the sheer size of the plane rather than due to the, uh, I guess, the, the rudder or the, the lack of authority from control surfaces. It's just that the plane is so massive that it's difficult to get such you know, guns on target. Look at the fuselage, look at where the pilot sits, and look at how massive the plane itself is. And think about... Think about the scale of this monster, this beauty. And then you look at the the little details in it, the you know, the the cockpit and the, all the, the the canopy. You look at the control surfaces, you look at the the wings, look how big the wings are. And you think, well, what can I use this for? You look at the, the characteristics of this plane, and essentially it does two things well. It goes fast and it does uh, it performs well at high altitudes and high speeds. And that's what you've got to use this plane for. And since it got its airspawn now, it's actually quite decent. It's it's not a bad plane to fly. Um, it's a real, real shame that uh, the hype was killed for this plane when it was released. Because everyone was really, really excited about it. Everyone had been asking for this particular plane and the Horton 229 for God knows how long. And, you know, planes like these come out. And everyone's extremely excited because these projects by the by the Germans in the 1940s and the late and the late World War II were extremely ambitious. Uh, some of them worked quite well. Some of them were never to be tried again, such as the ME163, although it was extremely interesting. Uh, and then we have projects like the Dornier 335, where you can see that the plane is actually quite decent, and it's a little bit. It's a little bit fun. It's just, it's it's got that kind of charm to it. It's like this big bertha, but it's a little bit agile, and it's got great guns, and it's a perfect bomber hunter. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do. Unfortunately for me, the enemies don't actually have any bombers, which is a first. The bombers just seem to be mysteriously gone. And that's extremely odd, honestly. Um, I at first was wondering, where are they all? Uh, and then I realized I was fighting mostly Russians. So, that probably explains it. No, I guess, uh, notable Russian bombers, and therefore no notable hunters 
needed for it, such as the 335. But uh, that's not to worry, because I'm essentially just climbing towards them, gaining my altitude. Uh, but I don't realize that most of the enemy is, in fact, either down low or trying to engage my bombers. Uh, stupid me decides to turn for the clusterfuck of fighters over to the right, but there is an LA-11 and an LA-7, who will appear soon, going to hunt those Dorniers and those uh, Heinkel 177s. Now, that was my mistake. I should have gone and helped them. Yeah, but at the same time, I think I was I was looking at going for these bomb for these fighters because the fighters uh, in the cluster were a lot more important to me at the time. In retrospect, I should have gone for the LA-11 and the LA-7, but it's okay because uh, all's well that ends well. <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, climbing a little bit, just gently, and there comes another LA-11 and another LA-7 coming for that Heinkel 177. And immediately seeing them, I turn around, because there's some close fighters that I can engage, and there's some utility that I can uh, expose, uh, expend to be of benefit to my team. I'm in a good strategic point, and my bomber is acting as good bait. The LA-11 and the LA-7 are very, very fixated on the uh, Heinkel 177, and I'm guessing that, you know, both these guys are in a squad and maybe grinding together, one with the LA-11 and one with the premium LA-7, and that turns out to be the case. Um, they finish off the Heinkel 177 to my dismay, uh, and then I try and push ahead on with the LA-11. He smartly avoids. I try and go for that re-engage, but it's just too fat. I'm traveling too fast, and I just can't get the guns on target. And then the LA-7 LA comes in, and he decides to go for some funny maneuvers and goes right in front of my guns. That is the magic of German cannon armament. They're just beautiful. And when they're in the nose, you can pull off very, very close shots like that that no other Allied plane can compare, uh, except for perhaps the P-63 and the jets. But uh, no jets up here, and no P-63. So, LA-7 is dead, and the LA-11 wants revenge. I decide, you know what, I'm going to push ahead on, and he's going to die if I'm going to take him down, and if he's going to take me down. He goes for that head-on, and then realizes at the last second, tries to evade, but he's lost too much speed in the climb going back up for me, and the turnaround, and so he basically just puts himself in front of my guns without much of an issue. Putting those German cannons to work, and it's just beautiful. Beautiful tears from the Russians. That might be something that uh, some of you wearaboos might love, but uh, oh, I, I can't get enough of German cannons. They're just gorgeous guns. Everything about MG151s, I just absolutely love. There's, there's pretty much nothing I would change apart from perhaps the muzzle velocity, but when you're facing propeller planes, it's not that much of an issue. You can pretty much make it work regardless of the situation, and especially if you get up close. Use, use some stealth belts or air targets. Um, I have actually had, <laughs> funny I say that, limited success with uh, ground target belts, but I don't recommend picking them. I would say go for the air targets, universal or stealth, uh, depending on what your preference is. Now, for me, what I'm doing is I'm just cruising at altitude. I know that there is an entire four-man squad of... Uh, planes, and they're probably all grinding with all their mates, so there's a Yak-9, I believe it's a Yak-9M, uh, P-63, and two LA-7s. So, what do I do? I put that dive rate to work, I hit the WEP, and I come in lightning fast, looking for some easy targets. Now I can see, I can see that the TAR-152 is baiting them all for me, and they're all extremely fixated, they're just incredibly tunnel visioned. And this P-63 puts himself in a really, really unwise position. He pretty much just stalls himself out for me. And I'm just waiting, just waiting, and oh, and off goes his wing. The LA-7 and the Yak-9K try to react, but I'm long gone by then because I've just picked up so much speed in a dive. And another TAR-152 comes and swoops in. Now, it's a pretty much even 2v2, 2v three-ish situation with that uh, Focke Wolf 190 in the distance, uh, but I decide, you know what, I'm going to go for it. 
We've got that Yak 9K and that LA7. They're both on lower energy states than me. They've both been turning. They've both been running after that uh, TAR 152. And uh, the Yak 9 decides he wants to evade. And I'm not going to push that because uh, he's just evading too well, I guess. He's a bit slow and I underestimate that. So no worries. Just zoom up again. Gentle zoom climb to try and get some distance, some separation away from the LA7. And uh, then I can put it back into a climb, get that, uh, convert that altitude, uh, that speed into altitude again, and have that advantage and maintain that advantage over the LA7 and the Yak-9. And whilst the Yak-9 and LA7 perform way better at this altitude than me, I can still keep energy over them regardless. Now the Yak-9K gets taken out by the TAR, and that leaves me with the LA7. So that puts us in a 2v1. Not a bad situation. Uh, the TAR-152 did his work, he baited himself, and the AK-9K fell for it. Now, we've just got this LA-7 left, and I'm gaining my speed again. I'm not wepping because I don't want to overheat my engine. I think it's the rear engine that seems to overheat like crazy, and I don't understand why. It's got that air scoop, it's got the cooling systems everywhere, it's got plenty of radiators, and I believe that some air goes through the fuselage from the front. So I don't really understand why. Uh, it overheats so much, but that's not to worry. I'll hammer the web anyway for a little bit, and he puts himself in a funny spot, so I can't get guns on. But that's alright. It's a 2v1, so I'm going to bleed some energy in order to get onto his 6. Uh, that's something that you can do if you're in a, uh, a considerable energy advantage. But uh, I would recommend holding off until you're in a 2v... or in a multiple engagement situation in your favour. Now that LA-7 puts himself in front of my guns because his energy is just way too low, and he pan and the uh, uh, TAR-152 pancakes into the ground, unfortunately. So, not a whole lot I could do for that TAR there, but uh, we've won a, a 4v2, essentially, by separating the enemies and uh, eliminating them one by one. Now, the only guy left is an LA-7, and he's run back to his airfield. Now, the, the beauty of this map in particular, there's something genuinely nice about these larger maps uh, that I don't find on any other map, and the, that's the fact that there are two airfields. And so what Gaijin have done, I, I think this is actually a really, really good idea. They've removed the AA from those airfields entirely and made the map larger and given you more options to land. So if you need to go and land your plane, you're not tunneled into landing on the one airfield or taking a risky forward airfield. You've got two relatively safe airfields in the corner that you can go and rearm, repair, and change your ordnance. But on the flip side of that, you've got no air cover, or no anti-air cover, from base AA. And this eliminates the issues of camping bases, and this also gives players an option to sort of hide from the enemy and not be discovered by them. So... I start to I start to head over to him and I just I I know that these players might actually have a couple of games under their belt just considering by the way that they're playing in a four man squad and there's a name that I recognize uh, so I'm thinking maybe they're on voice comms maybe they know what they're doing uh, should I take it easy should I play aggressively should I toy with him uh, this guy turns out to know me anyway as a subscriber so how are you doing mate. Uh, we did have a, a pretty good dogfight, and I'm sorry that I couldn't respond because I'm I'm still on a chat ban. So, not a whole lot I can do there. But that the the fight that's about to happen is a is a pretty decent fight, and this is where the weakness of the Dornier 335 comes into play. The plane doesn't climb terribly well, as you can see. The LA7 has recently taken off, maybe a minute and a half ago, and he's already at my altitude. Uh, not only that, but he's probably already at my speed, so we have roughly equal energy states. And since he's a prop, and he's smaller than me, he's lighter, he's probably got a more powerful en uh, engine, or power-to-weight ratio, I would say, uh, considering that uh, high-end propeller uh, high-end props, especially with multiple engines, tend to have a, a, a law of diminishing returns. So if you put, say, 20 engines on a Dornier 335, it probably wouldn't be as fast as the one we've got in-game. So he does the smart thing, and he goes for an evade. He rolls out of my way, and as I'm going in for those quick passes, I can't really do much 
And there we go. There's one of the major weaknesses of the Dornier 335 again. We're on equal energy states. And so my energy retention at low altitudes isn't as good as his because he's lighter. He's got a better engine uh, per, per his weight. And uh, I'm starting to play a little bit aggressive. I'm trying to make that kill nice and quick. One, so I can win this match, get the ace. And two, so I don't end up his dinner. And uh, this is probably where I make my biggest mistake. I turn into him and I commit to that, uh, to that dogfight. And you can see I'm starting to panic here. I'm, I'm rolling out of the way. Uh, and the only thing that really saves me is uh, if you look in the corner, my internet or the servers have gone to complete dog shit. So uh, I'm getting packet loss and ping spikes and he's jumping around the place and I'm jumping around the place. And it's, uh, it was very lucky. I, I got extremely lucky that uh, something decided to die. And you can see me here. I'm trying to roll out of the way. I'm just trying to get onto his six. Uh, and I've sort of forced the overshoot with the A7M coming in to save me. Uh, but if he wasn't there, I probably would have died. I try to go in for that shot, but the rudder just isn't powerful enough to swing such a massive plane over in such a short amount of time. I try and go for the uh, for the shot, and he ends up rolling into the ground. So I'll consider that an ace uh, as a maneuver kill. Uh, that was a decent dogfight until the A7 got in, uh, but I wouldn't have won without him. So, practically an ace in Germany's probably most famous super prop. Not a bad run. And uh, shout out to all the guys on the enemy team in the four-man squad. You guys put up a pretty good fight, and... Uh, it was good to see you all on the battlefield. First place. First place in a 335. You don't see that every day. But uh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much for 10,000 subscribers, which I'm sure will hit after this video goes live. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.